Welcome back, everybody, to Raven Stars Witching Hour. I'm your host, Solaris Blue Raven. My excellent guest tonight is Blake Percival. And, and did I say your last name right, Blake? Absolutely. Oh, great. It does remind me of the night. <laughs> so that's a, that's a nice name, and it I'll, certainly I'll suits you. i my heritage. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Very nice indeed. This is an incredible interview, by the way. I have so many questions, but I, I'd like you to go ahead and continue on. Um, sure. Just fascinating information. So thank you once again for all you do. I mean, this is um, very impressive, and I know it wasn't easy. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so, let's see. Um, so, after the government intervened in my case in, in October of 2013, um, the next thing that happened was, by law, they had to file their complaint against USIS uh, within 90 days. And they took the full 90 days. They, they filed their complaint in January of 2014. And... The uh, United States Department of Justice, when they filed that, they revealed some some stuff that you know is forever out there now, and and uh, part of what they uh, revealed goes back to what you were asking about a minute ago um, uh, about you know numbers and stuff, and um, they said now keep in mind that I was only the boss at this facility for a little over four months, um, but they said that. The fraud took place from at least 2008, so that's key to me that they don't really know how far it went back, but they could prove it went back to 2008, mm -hmm. and and that it didn't end until late 2012. Wow. So the part of that, I think you just picked up on it, that's key for me is I told them about it in July of 2011, and they let it continue until late 2012 and uh and you know and you got to think about you know what this was i mean this right. this was security clearances well um, yeah big time yeah and so so anyway so they go on in their complaint to say that during this time period usis committed fraud on at least 665,000 background investigations wow so my question is where are these people exactly. you know we're, we're we're talking about the potential that somebody is sitting in a missile silo with the ability to launch a, a nuclear missile and they were never cleared properly mm -hmm. a, a, any federal position you can think of uh somebody sitting in a a, a um, an air traffic control tower, you know, uh, that wasn't cleared properly. Uh, that, that to me is scary. Um, can I ask you something real quick? Um, Absolutely. the dumping itself, does that, you said it was strictly the company that started doing that. It wasn't approved by DC or, or somebody high up. You know, that's an interesting, uh, an interesting part of the story let me see if i can expound on a little bit i don't like to um well in my story i'll tell you what's factual and then i'll also tell you what i think but i don't know that i can prove okay <laughs> I, I like to keep it factual mm -hmm. um and so jokingly within the government opm is called other people's money now, it stands for the Office of Personnel Management, but they manage all kinds of – it's basically the human resources arm of the U.S. government. But it's called other people's money, jokingly, within the government because they don't – a lot of their – the majority of their funding doesn't come from Congress. And that usually shocks most people when I tell them that. But the way they get their funding is – Say the DEA wants to hire 50 new agents, and all these agents have to be cleared and, and you know have a security clearance background investigation done on them. So the DEA pays the Office of Personnel Management a certain amount, and I don't recall or know what the amount is today. So let's just say it's $3,500, you know, that they're charging the DEA to do each background investigation. So the DEA, who got the funds from Congress, pays OPM. And then at this time, OPM was paying USIS not the full amount they got from the DEA, but a portion, so say 3000 and pocketing 
500 bucks per investigation. Mm, wow. So you can see right there, like I said earlier, you know, I truly believe money's the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. If, if you follow the money, there was definitely a money motivator for people within the government to allow this to continue mm -hmm. because with every background investigation that USIS dumped, the federal government made money mm -hmm. or, or, you know, the office of personnel management, a, an office within the federal government. And it was kind of shocking to some members of Congress when they were doing all these hearings, when they put that together and figured mm -hmm. out that, uh, you know, within our own government, we had set up a system to where a private contractor was defrauding the government and an arm of our own government was making money off of it. Right. So, so anyway, so, um, 665,000 were processed improperly and, you know, I want to know who those people are. And, um, to date, I only know who three of them are and that's from just what's come out in the news. And that's Edward Snowden, Aaron Alexis that we already talked about. And then Imran Awan, this one just came to light this past year. Um, are you familiar with, um, Mr. Awan? Mm -mm. Okay. Mr. Let me tell you this story real quick. And, and I only bring him out because it came out, uh, that his security clearance was not done. Correct. It was one of the dumped security clearances, mm. but, um, he, um, uh, he was a, um, um, an immigrant from Pakistan. He came to the United States, uh, through the, the lottery program. And, um, he, uh, after being here for a few years, applied for and got us citizenship. And then, you know, once you're a U.S. citizen, you can get a security clearance. And anyway, he got a, um, a job, uh, working in Congress, uh, as an IT staffer. And, uh, he was, he was wow. working for, yeah, he was working for several members of Congress and his security clearance had been dumped by USIS and uh, he was working for several members of Congress, and the most prominent one that he worked for uh, was Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Oh, okay. And, no, okay, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so um, he, um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but the government has all kinds of purchasing rules, you know, to try to, to keep uh, tabs on, you know, what people are doing and that things are legitimate and stuff. Mm -hmm. But he had figured out a way to skirt – um, the purchasing rules. And I guess basically in Congress, the rule is uh, you don't have to have a purchase order for anything up to $500. Okay. So what he was doing was he was ordering um, computer parts that were under $500, having them sent to his home and then assembling and selling computers. Jeez. And, uh, yeah, and uh, but that wasn't the big thing he was doing. The other thing was, you know, when they started looking into those purchases, they also found that he was transferring large amounts of data off of Congress's computer systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, and lo and behold, his security clearance wasn't done correctly. Well, the day that he was placed under investigation by the FBI, the FBI notified all the members of Congress that he worked for, and they all fired him except – Debbie Wasserman Schultz. She kept him on as her IT person, even though he was under active investigation by the FBI. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, so um, a few months later, I believe it was this past October, he was arrested uh, at the airport in Washington, D.C., attempting to board a plane to back to Pakistan. And, and uh they arrested him because they were about to lose him. And, uh, right. when, and when they arrested him, uh, he'd already sent his family back to Pakistan and he had, um, uh, large amounts of data with him that he was attempting to leave the country with. And, you know, that's, I, I tell his story because that happened within Congress. Right. And yet, and yet he was one of these people that uh, he, he wasn't investigated properly. And that, to me, is shocking. It's, um, it's more than shocking. Can I ask you real quick, when they get a clearance level, what level is it for these people that they've approved or dumped? It depends. Um, they USIS, uh, like I said, uh, at, when I first went to work for the company, they did about 90% of all the security clearance investigations. And, and by the time uh, 
my career with them ended, they were still doing probably 60 to 70 percent of all the security clearance investigations. Um, so, that, I mean, and, and, you know, they did them all the way up through top secret. Um, oh, so, wow. so, yeah, so th- this literally is uh, p- people could be sitting anywhere. Um, right. You know, yeah. Doing any any type of job you can imagine for the federal government. So, that's no good. Oh, that's yeah. very concerning. This is huge. It yeah, really is. So unbelievable. Go ahead. So, <laughs> so it is unbelievable. And and um, anyway, so um, they uh, after having intervened in my case, um, you know, it kind of sat there with nothing happening on it again, you know, for quite a while. And then, um, uh, late in 2014, um, OPM's, um, computer system was hacked and they said it was by the Chinese and, uh, hundreds of thousands of federal employees, uh, personal information was stolen, uh, including fingerprints. And it was uh, it was through USIS's computer system that this happened, and uh, so you know throw that on top of being under investigation for defrauding our national security background investigation uh-huh. program, um, the government cut ties with them, and uh, uh, they didn't cancel their contract. They chose not to renew it. It was up for renewal in uh, September or October uh, of uh, twenty. Uh, 14 mm-hmm. and uh so anyway so they they cut ties with them and um as a result of that uh usis filed bankruptcy and you know it was kind of troubling to me um keep in mind i'm still working three jobs nobody from the federal government has even said thank you to blake percival i, I mean mm-hmm. you know i'm st- i'm still out here struggling uh, I've got the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, 60 Minutes calling my house, wanting to interview me, but I can't talk. <laughs> mm-hmm. right. It's it was a, it was a little bit of a difficult time, but anyway. Um, so this went on. Um, it, it just appeared that that again, the government really didn't want to, in my opinion, deal with this problem of what to do um, with the case. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think, again, this is me thinking I can't prove this, but I think that one of the reasons they didn't really want to deal with it was um, I, I think if they would have gone into prosecutions um, uh, of these people, that that they may have been exposed like you were asking a minute ago. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think I think that they may have ended up having to prosecute some federal employees. And, right. uh, and, and I think they were trying to avoid that. So anyway, the case did end up settling uh, in August of 2015. And um, quite honestly, the only re- well, uh, late in 2014, the Department of Justice contacted me and said, uh, you know, and keep in mind, I'm, I'm four years into this thing at this point. And been working, you know, menial jobs the whole time. And uh, they contacted me and said uh, that USIS has filed bankruptcy. And at the end of the bankruptcy, there will be no more USIS. So the way we see it, uh, when that happens, your case is over. And um, that's the end of it. And I was... I was blown away. I mean, you know, I've sacrificed everything to bring this to light and, and to stop it. And, uh, and it, I, I just, you know, I, from that point in my life, uh, the, through this experience, I think I, I began to look at, at our department of justice completely different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so USIS, uh, was doing everything they could to get out of, uh, the responsibility they had, you know, for, for, for what they'd been doing. And it appeared to me that the government was going to let them. And anyway, I, I went to work with the lawyers and I basically, in order, the government told me in order to keep it going, you're going to have to show us a link taking it higher than USIS because, uh, USIS had kind of set up a shell game, uh, to where that, uh, USIS was, Initially, 
you know, they, they were a company and, and they were buying other companies. And then what they did was they created a company that pretty much was a company in name only that owned USIS and all these other companies USIS had bought. Mm -hmm. And that company was known as Altegrity. Uh, kind of ironic to me mm. that they <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> named themselves after Integrity. But anyway, mm. <laughs> uh, Altegrity was the holding company. And, and um, they were telling me, you know, if you can't make the link to Altegrity, um, after USIS goes away, uh, your, your case is done. Mm -hmm. So I went to work with the lawyers and, uh, I was, I was able to provide that link to them uh, or for them. And, uh, yeah. the, the case was in uh, bankruptcy court, uh, not my case, but the, 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 you know, USIS's, uh, existence was in bankruptcy court. And, um, after I was able to convince the government, they went into bankruptcy court and objected to USIS's uh, bankruptcy. And, you know, I, when that happened, it, I, for me, it was kind of an aha moment because I felt like my world again was continuing to dissolve around me. And then all of a sudden, USIS had made a major blunder. They had filed bankruptcy, which bankruptcy is run by the federal government. And so once I convinced the government, and I guess also let them know that I'm not going away, mm -hmm. um, they went into bankruptcy court and objected, and USIS could not get out of bankruptcy without the government's approval. <laughs> so mm -hmm. they, they were caught. And so um, what they did then was uh, they negotiated with the government, um, and... The government came to, to me through my lawyers and asked uh, if I would object if they allowed them to settle uh, for basically the same amount of money that they had told them they could settle for back in 2013 um, when they were offering them a hardship settlement. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, let's face it. I mean, I've been, been struggling for four and a half years. And just a few months earlier, the government was telling me, look, you're going to walk out of this with nothing. <laughs> my, my attitude at this point was, you know, it, it's time for me to, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to reap from everything that I've gone through. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so anyway, so, um, I, I was pretty agreeable to whatever the government wanted to do at this point, if they would just do something. And, uh, so they worked out a deal with USIS to where the USIS, agreed to forfeit a claim to a little bit more than $30 million that the government still owed them for work mm -hmm. they had done for the government. Um, so they were going to forfeit this money and then the government at that point would then just have to work out, you know, what percentage of that I would be entitled to. Mm -hmm. um, so they settled with USIS in August of 2015. Uh, but then they, just sort of again went to doing nothing and uh, that was that was very frustrating for me because you know it was all over the news and wall street journal and uh, you know they recouped a little more than 30 million dollars and i'm still working multiple jobs and right. uh, and uh, and and by law i was entitled to 15 to 30 percent of whatever they recouped uh from this fraud um mm -hmm. So anyway, um, it was odd. And, uh, you know, as Christmas was approaching of 2015, uh, I remember going Christmas shopping for our granddaughter and our budget was 60 bucks. And, mm -hmm. uh, and yet the government owed me at a minimum a couple million dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, so anyway, they, they did end up settling with me. Well, not settling with me. It's actually called an award, a whistleblower award, uh, mm -hmm. in, in December. Well, it was December 18th. Um, you want to talk about, uh, a blessing at Christmas time, yeah, December, say. 8th. Yeah. December 18th of 2015. Uh, they gave me my whistleblower award and it was 20%. So the, the quick math on that is just a little bit more than $6 million. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that, that yeah. you got something out of it. But my goodness, what that was an ordeal. It was, and it, it you know, it 
for us, it appeared it was never going to end. <laughs> it appeared it yeah. appeared that everything that could happen to slow it down and drag it out, you know, was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, uh, but, but, you know, I, I would say this, uh, winning never is easy in this world. And, uh, and I would encourage anybody, you know, um, when the facts are on your side, there are things that are worth standing up for. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and, you know, and, and I talked about working multiple jobs and, and, uh, that's just, I mean, I, again, I throw that back to just the way I was raised. I knew that I couldn't back down and that I just had to muscle through this. Mm-hmm. Well, I applaud you for that. Yeah, persistence and truth. You know, the bottom line is doing the right thing. You're talking about right. morals and ethics, and I believe in that. And the thing is, I don't see very much of that going on anymore. It seems like there's so many levels of corruption that it's so <laughs> concerning. I mean, it's almost sickening. It is, yeah. and and so that's weird. one reason that uh, – you know, anytime I'm invited to share my story, I do because people need to hear that you can do the right thing and you can win. And mm-hmm. it's not easy, and I'm not saying it's easy, uh, but you can. You can win, and and people need to hear that that um, th- that a good guy wins occasionally. Yeah, um, that's that needs to happen more often. There's no doubt. Now, you do you are affiliated with a firm, right, for whistleblowers or no? I am. Yeah. Uh, can I talk a little bit about that? Sure. Absolutely. All right. Yes. All right. So let me, let me first, um, if it's okay, mm-hmm. talk about the whistleblower law. You know, okay. uh, th- there's a lot of different types of whistleblowers. Um, but the actual whistleblower law, it's the key TAM law. And it was actually set up under Abraham Lincoln's administration. And, um, it was set up because during the civil war, um, Companies were selling the federal government gunpowder that wouldn't work and cannons that would blow up when they fired them and and guns that wouldn't shoot. And uh, so Abraham Lincoln and Congress came up with the Ketan program. And basically what it is, is anybody that points out fraud, waste or abuse to the federal government and allows the government uh, to, uh, you know, take action on it. Um, is then awarded by the government uh, anywhere from uh, 10 to 30 uh, percent of the money that the government's able to recoup from the person that's been defrauding the government. So what it does is it throws money out there um, to incentivize uh, mm-hmm. investigators and uh, lawyers to work on your behalf to to prove the fraud and stop the fraud. So it's good for the government, and yet it also, uh, you know, ends up, in some cases, handsomely rewarding uh, the person that exposed it. Mm-hmm. So um, about a year after my case settled, I was actually contacted by a Washington, D.C. law firm uh, that the, the law firm is protect us law or protect us law, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, but protect us law, uh, contacted me and they basically said that if I would let them use my name and my story, uh, that they would make me a member of the law firm. In other words, give me part ownership of the law firm. And I'm not a lawyer. Um, but, this law firm uh, touts themselves as the whistleblowers law firm. And all they do is whistleblower cases. And uh, so they did, they gave me part ownership in it. And I'm now a member of the law firm. It's located in Washington, DC. They also have offices uh, in Los Angeles. And um, if you go to their website, it's protectuslaw.com. Uh, you can read my bio and, and see, you know, information about me and my case and the other people that are members of the law firm. It's interesting. This law firm was actually started by a guy named Neil Roberts and Neil Roberts was actually a successful whistleblower twice himself. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And so if you think about it, who better to guide you through the minefield, as I would call it, uh, of whistleblowing than an actual whistleblower? And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, been there, done that. And, uh, so anyway, um, that's, uh, that, that's the law firm. Um, it's, uh, yeah, if anybody uh, is interested, you can email me through the law firm. You can, you know, go on, uh, protectuslaw.com. Uh, there's also the phone number there. 
uh, on there. Uh, I'll be glad to talk to you. Since I am a member of the law firm, I can give you attorney-client privilege when we discuss it, so you can discuss it with me, and you don't have to worry about you know me then running and telling somebody about it or or whatever. But um, it, there's about eight guys that are prior whistleblowers that are members of the law firm. Then there's lawyers and investigators and. Uh, it's been quite a unique experience for me being involved in that. Mm-hmm. Well, I can imagine. I think it's fantastic. I, I'm very, very happy to see this in motion. I think it's wonderful. And once again, you know, I have to thank you for everything you've done and, and putting yourself out there. And you did put your neck out there, and I'm glad that you, um, you know, were paid because it's just ridiculous this whole thing. And, and the fact of the matter is, you know, you've got all these people, like you're saying, who are probably not they sh- shouldn't have clearances, and who knows what they're doing and where they're operating from. That's very concerning. It is, and. You know, um, I, shortly after my case settled, I actually, on my own dime, that's another thing that was somewhat shocking to me. I was never asked to come to Washington, D.C. and talk to us. You know, come tell us what you know. You know, Congress was holding all these hearings. They never they never had me come talk to them. Um, but, but when the case settled on my own dime, I went to Washington, D.C., and I met with uh, – two or three congressmen and senators and, and their staffs and uh, talk to them about my concerns. And one of my concerns is, you know, at that point, two people had come out, you know, as having been people that had, their clearances had been dumped, but now three. So there's 664,997 people running around that were given a security clearance and not investigated properly. Mm-hmm. I think, that um, somebody owes the American people a, a explanation. Did we mm-hmm. back up, identify, and reinvestigate all these people, or did we just say, you know, oh, well, going forward, we'll do it right? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I posed right. that question when I went to Washington, D.C. two years ago. To date, I have not got an answer to that question. And mm-hmm. uh, that, that, for me, is, uh, is troubling. Um, it is troubling. Well, just, you know, if I may, you know, back then it was Obama. I call him Obama, but it was Obama administration. And literally, <laughs> it seemed like he was a Trojan horse. I mean, he allowed a lot of sabotage to happen within the United States, in my opinion. He allowed people to come in that probably didn't, uh, shouldn't be here. And then so far as taking this country down from the inside out, that's just my own impression. And when you start talking about some of these things that are happening, I don't I don't think this was an accident. You know, I, right. like you were saying, it's, it's more than dumping. These guys knew what they were doing. And somebody out there, obviously in D.C. area, somebody was aware of it as well. Then you have all these people that God only knows what they're up to. But I can tell you one thing, if they have national security access, then they have cyber warfare access, then they have all kinds of other things. And and that's bad. You know, and and another thing that I would throw out there is look at what they settled with them for. Um, A little over 30 million. The Wall Street Journal had done a, a front page story about my case. And they said that if the government fully prosecuted this case, it was worth $7.6 billion. And our government settled for $30 million. And, and keep in mind, like I said earlier, at the time, this company was owned by the largest private equity firm in the world. They had $100 billion invested around the world. And our government settled for pennies on the dollar. Mm-hmm. Right. So who was the who was the owner or who owned the company itself when you were um, filing the suit against them? At the time that I filed the suit. um, So you had USIS and Mm -hmm. um, USIS fell under uh, a shell company that was uh, Altegrity and then Altegrity was owned by Providence Equity Partners. Okay. So they have, see, this to me is very sneaky. I think it's almost like they're trying to change things. And you know, I have to go back into, <laughs> you know, I'm going to comment here, but, but it, I go back into the, the Bin Laden family. That's big. Okay. Yeah, so you, you sold, they sold the company to Carlisle and, and then you were mentioning how they were involved and that was around 9-11, right? right. Yeah. It was. So that's not a coincidence right there in my opinion. So how many people back then, were they dumping then and yeah. giving them clearances? Right. Well, well, you know, and, and, uh, I, I don't know. And and I don't think our government has the ability to know. And like I pointed out in their own filing, so this is a fact, they said that the dumping went back to, and you know, everything in legal wording is worded that way for a reason. They said it went back to at least 
2008. So, you know, mm-hmm. who know? I, th- I think that is key to say we can prove it went back to 2008. We don't know how far it goes back. Right. Well, that's what they were willing to admit. No, I agree with you on that one. And I know I, it's not really speculation, but, you know, when you smell a rat, you smell a rat. And since they've been <laughs> cheaters, they're not going to all of a sudden just be, oh, we're just going to decide to dump now. I, I would suspect that they probably were doing that all along and, and you caught them. And thank goodness that woman came forward and talked about it, too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you. But I have to applaud you for what you've done. And did you ever feel very threatened, like, uh, insofar as your family or yourself or your safety during this? You know, um, Yes. Um, I was considered a protected federal witness, but they provided no protection. Um, you know, they, they considered the fact that my case was filed under seal. That was my protection. You know, mm-hmm. supposedly uh, nobody knew who had filed this allegation. And um, so from the time I was fired in 2011, until they unsealed it in 2013, so a little over two years. Uh, during that time, yeah, there were a couple things where you know that happened. I know I was being surveilled. I know that if this company, uh, being as large as they were, uh, could have found any dirt on me, it would have been you know exposed. Uh, you also you know, think about it. Um, I, I know that at one time the federal government was surveilling me. And part of that is, you know, if you're going to be their key witness, they want to know who you are and that there's no dirt on you, <laughs> mm-hmm, right. you know? So, so that took place. And then uh, let me share this. Um, there was one time, um, and I don't know if you've read the, the, When my case ended, um, I did sit down with the Washington Post and and they did a front page article on me, you know, about me finally, finally getting out of this whistleblower situation. Mm -hmm. And in that they uh, one part that a lot of people liked or enjoyed reading was, um, you know, um, when 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 this all happened at 45 years old, me and my wife ended up setting up our bed in my mother's uh, living room and hanging a sheet over the door, you know, for, for, it was a glass door for, for privacy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's pretty humbling when you're, mm-hmm. you know, that far into a career. And uh, anyway, right. so while I was there at my mother's house, I wanted to, to, you know, I didn't have a job and uh, I, you know, I was looking for a job and um, I, I wanted to, to, be useful. And I wanted to do things, you know, to thank my mom for letting us move in with her. So, um, I was out front one day and I was, I was trimming her hedges, um, out front of her house, um, mostly azaleas. And anyway, I was, I was trimming them and, um, having worked in law enforcement, I'm always pretty aware of what's going on around me. And as soon as I went outside, I noticed a vehicle that did not fit in. And, uh, my mother lives, uh, at a T intersection. And, uh, her house kind of faces, uh, two different streets, but it's, it's, you know, at a T intersection with a stop sign. And this vehicle was a black SUV and it was sitting, um, at a spot in this T intersection where there was no house. Uh, it was up against uh, a place in the road where there was a hedge next to it and, it, it, it's not where any of her neighbors would have, it just stuck out, you know, it, mm-hmm. it, it shouldn't have been there. And uh, so I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm trimming the hedges and, and I'm making sure I'm keeping, you know, note of, of this vehicle. And, uh, it, you know, it had blacked out windows. And, um, uh, at one point my wife and my mother came out to see what I was doing and, you know, whether I was doing it up to mom's standards and, uh, they came out and, and I was explaining, I told them, I said, you know, don't look. And they did what people always do when you tell them <laughs> that the first thing they did was look. And so, you know, with both of them staring over there, we see this guy, you can see through the windshield and we see this guy crawl from the back of the vehicle into the driver's seat and he cranks it up and drives away. And I know for a fact that he was out there watching me. Um, 
and there were several other times during that time period where I know they were watching me. And, um, yeah, we, we, uh, you know, even today, I mean, the case is settled now and, and, um, the government considered me to, you know, not be any danger once, uh, my name was released because the government had taken over the case and, uh, the details of the case were already out there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but even, you know, even now we're, 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 we're conscious of our surroundings and we we remain security conscious at all times. Mm -hmm. well, that's very good. And of course, did you, when you said you were being surveilled, was, does that include um, your phones being tapped and, or, ta or things like that? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> I yes, figured as much. Yeah. Yeah. So you get the whole thing. That's yeah. amazing. But yeah, it's just uh, incredible how you can, how, how many levels there are to this thing. You know, I can only imagine what you've discovered is probably the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, it is. That's and, and, you know, um, you know, once you, once you're aware of a certain type of crime or a certain area of the law, uh, you, you, you hear about it. it. It's not that you weren't hearing about it before. It's just, you didn't pay any attention to it because you weren't aware of what it was, you know? <laughs> and, right. and I'm amazed now at, uh, all the false claim act, which that's a key Tam case, uh, cases that are going on. It, it is absolutely astounding how much fraud there is in this country right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, very concerning. There's no doubt. You know, what keeps sticking out too is that Aaron Alexis because, you know, he was quote unquote hearing voices and I know there's technology to hit people psychotronically and, and with a uh, covert technology to interface yeah. that communication. And, and it's obvious he reeked of that in my opinion. So that tells yeah. me an awful lot. Now that's, that's like almost like, okay, so not only did he not get approved for that position, but literally somebody else got him too. So you have to ask <laughs> what's going on here. I mean, there's this, like, once again, there's all these levels to it. That's right. Something it's else, like an so. onion, peeling an yeah. onion. Right. So if people are out there and say they have something they want to um, communicate and they're, um, they obviously can contact you through the, through the agency itself. But um, what do you look for with, with whistleblowers in, in general? You, you know, um, it, it it's such a wide gamut of what it can be. It's hard to say what they should look for. Mm -hmm. um, but, but if it doesn't pass the smell test, you know, if it, if it, if it reeks of there's just something wrong here, sometimes if you'll just talk with somebody that specializes in, in whistleblower cases, they can help you figure out why, you know, <laughs> and sometimes it's not one plaintiff uh, or in this case called a relator. That's what the person that brings a key case is. Sometimes it's not one that brings it forward that ends up exposing it. Sometimes it has to be two or three people. And, uh, and, and you know, uh, sometimes if one person will come forward um, and get an investigation going on, then you'll get the other people that can prove what just doesn't smell right. Right. Yeah. Well, I'll have to talk to you off air sometime <laughs> into my documentary, but I, I do have evidence. I mean, I have internal evidence. I have a lot of things. I just, you know, I do know one thing. Um, these guys have a lot of money to do and, and cover their tracks like you wouldn't believe. And I'm sure you're pretty aware of that when it comes down to certain uh, organizations. And they're very smooth sometimes. They're very orchestrated. It's unbelievable. Oh, yeah. So you know, I applaud you for everything you've done. I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for who you are. You know, I heard your interview and I had to get you on my show and I'm really glad I did. And I need, I, I mean, I like the fact that people can hear you uh, because they need to hear you too and, and understand that this is, uh, you can win these things. Like you said, if you keep yeah. the integrity going. You know, and, and, and this, this, um, the, the position I was in when I discovered this, there'd been several other directors during this time period, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and. I have no doubt that it would still be going on today uh, had Blake mm -hmm. Percival not, you know, accepted that job. And I've often said, you know, when, when they called me from Minneapolis and asked me, you know, if I was interested in that position, I've often said, I am so glad that I didn't know the road I was going to go down because had I known, there, there's no way I would have chosen to take my family through all that. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. No kidding. And, and, you know, the thing is, the key component, I think, was the communication that you opened up with the employees, because it sounds yeah. like the other directors didn't do that. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, you can't tell me that when when this was almost blurted out to me, you can't tell me that it wasn't because she felt comfortable talking to me, you mm -hmm. know, and yeah. uh, and and like I said, 
they had brought me there for that purpose. Um, supposedly they, you know, to, to, to relate with the employees. And it just so happened that in doing that, um, their, their, their dirty little secret was exposed. Right. Well, you're very genuine. I think that's what it is. You put people at ease. Yeah. That's really oh, nice. And you, you know what else concerns me? Oh, you're welcome. And you know what else concerns me also is the, the fingerprints that were stolen. You were talking about, that's just you, you yeah. the potential. Um, <laughs> that, that, you know, that, that for me was, uh, insult to injury because here I was, they had fired me. I never got my severance package. You know, I couldn't accept that. Um, so I never got my severance package. And then two years after they fired me, um, you know, I'm, I'm the whistleblower, but they don't know it at that point. Uh, and I get a letter from them telling me that, uh, all my personal information, you know, all my family's social security numbers, uh, and my fingerprints, uh, were, were hacked and stolen. So, <laughs> wow. Well, you know, how do you, how do you combat something like that? People have all well, that information. Yeah. You know, um, I, I tell you this, in, anybody, uh, millions of people across the United States got that same letter that I got. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, the thing that I would advise anybody is hang on to that letter because, uh, let's face it. If uh, if your fingerprints are out there and you're ever accused of a crime, uh, and the evidence is fingerprints, uh, I, I think you have a <laughs> a defense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, you I know? tend to agree with you on that one. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, so, you know, this whole thing. But then, but I'm sorry. Then, then one other thing uh, that they did do, and Congress actually forced uh, the Office of Personnel Management to do this, is anybody that was, um, that their information was compromised during that hack, um, the federal government had to provide them with 10 years of, um, I forget what they call it, but um, credit monitoring, mm -hmm. um, you know, because... Uh, if, if they have all that information about you, then they absolutely can get credit in your name. So that, you know, that was one thing they did. If you ask me, that's not near enough, but mm -mm. that's, that's something that's a trinket they threw to everybody that, that did lose their information in that. Right. Hack. Well, they also have that life lock type stuff too. You can get exactly. Right? Yeah. And I think that's a good idea. That's just my own impression, but I, I know uh, I want to touch a little bit on your book because you, you mentioned that you are writing a book or you finished a book and it's uh, tell us what's I going did. on with that. Well, thank you for asking. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. Uh, you know, when when my story, when, when the case closed and my story hit the Washington Post, I had initial offers, you know, uh, 60 minutes and and stuff. And, and I, I didn't want to get into the whole that being my life. You know, face it, mm -hmm. me and my family had just been through hell right. and, uh, and and we needed some some family time and. And I wanted to do it on my terms uh, as far as writing a book. And so I wrote my book completely by myself, and I actually finished it last month. Nice. And, uh, I, thank you. And I, I put it in the hands of uh, uh, an entertainment attorney that is shopping it now for a, a book deal. And mm -hmm. uh, we'll see where that goes. But I anticipate that, uh, I don't know, sometime in the next few months that uh, I'll funny. have some more news coming out about that. Excellent. Do you have a title or no? I don't. Um, I, I did come up with one and and uh, me and my wife kind of batted it around and I decided that uh, I would wait and take the advice from from people that, you know, specialize in putting out out books. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's um, the notoriety that was around my case, uh, I, I think, is going to give me some some bargaining room on, uh, you know, getting somebody uh, a, a big firm. You know what I'm saying to to oh, yeah. to do the book and and if they do, then I'm I'm hoping that they've got some experts that can help me choose the right title to to catch people's attention. Oh yeah, I'm sure they can. It also sounds like it could be a script, but I don't know, you know, how cheesy <laughs> that can become. You know what I mean? But it is an, it's very incredible. It, in the it, whole you know, it, it does case. it does pull in a lot of things that my wife likes to say. I'm one of the most famous people that nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> well, now they heard of you. <laughs> and, and speaking of which, are are you going to be doing any more public speaking or anything like that? Have you have any interest? in doing that or I do um, I do it you know whenever people um, offer me that you know when I'm offered the opportunity I try to do it you know oh. I, I, 
I, uh, I've been, um, I, again, I try to do it on my terms, you know, uh, when, when, when I came out of this, one thing that we hadn't mentioned is, you know, nobody was prosecuted from this, right? There are, there are multimillionaires all over this country because there were, you know, quite a few people involved in this that, um, went right on with their lives and, and, you know, the company paid a, a fine, but, um, the, nobody went to jail. And so mm-hmm. I kind of, I just like sharing with people the good news that you can do the right thing and win. I want to exist and share my story because these guys still got to look in the mirror and they still got to face their families. And I want them to hear my story and have their family say, didn't you used to be in charge at that company? Mm, right. <laughs> yeah. And what, what about their clearances, Blake? Do they get to keep all their clearances and their access? Well, um, you know, in the investigation that the Department of Justice did, uh, I don't know exactly how many, but somewhere around two dozen people did end up losing their clearances. Um, I don't think anybody was debarred. That would be the next step where, you know, people can never work for the government again. I don't think anybody got debarred. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the shocking thing for me has been that some of the key players uh, from the scheme um, now are just working for other companies that are doing business for the government. So uh, you've kind of seen a shuffling of the deck, if you will. Mm-hmm. That's not good. No. Yeah. And I have to ask how many companies are doing something similar. You know, that's another thing, the pattern. Yeah. Uh, if you're talking about, uh, you know, companies doing that type of work, mm-hmm. um, I think there's, I think there's now five companies that do background investigations for the federal government. And that's, you know, another one of my pet peeves is the government had the chance to fix this, you mm-hmm. know, once it was exposed and they kind of put a band aid on it. They, right. they, they did in response to, you know, everything that happened, they did create a new federal agency and that agency, I had said that initially it was the office of personnel management office of federal investigation. Well, um, and, and I talked about the, the, the motivator, the money motivator for OPM. Mm-hmm. Well, they created a new a new federal agency, and it's called the NBIB, the National Background Investigations Bureau. Uh, and it, it eventually is supposed to fall under the Department of Defense, but currently it still falls under OPM. So here we are, um, 2018. I told them about this in 2011. Mm-hmm. And you still have security clearances being managed by the Office of Personnel Management and every security clearance that's processed, the Office of Personnel Management makes money. Um, wow. So that fraud motivator is still there. It's very concerning. And I can only imagine how many um, saboteurs we have. Yeah. Literally, it seems to me like that's happening. And I have to ask you, you know, um, it, it's considering, you know, just looking at the timeline in America right now, what do you think is the biggest internal adversary we have here in America? Um... <laughs> I, I don't know that I can narrow it down to one. Okay, I was just know? curious. What's our most, what do you think is most vulnerable? I know this is a huge one. What you've what you've addressed is probably to me. I, th- I think it's one of the most, you know, serious. Yeah, you know, um, if you think about, well, first off, if we as a society are going to have people cleared, uh, investigated, uh, you know, before they can see our national secrets. Uh, and we're going to say that it's important, well, then we ought to do it right. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, you know, one of the things that's ironic is, you know, in response to 9-11, we federalized what used to be private, uh, all the people that are now TSA, all the people that check you when you're getting on the airplane. Mm. Um, All that used to be private. And their investigations are done by uh, people that aren't federal employees Mm -hmm. still, you know. And and so, you know, it's no longer USIS, but it's other companies. And how does that that make sense? How does it make sense that 
you're going to investigate people uh, with with private companies um, because they need investigating. Uh, but you know the 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 people that you're investigating uh, that work at the airport, they have to be federal employees. That mm-hmm. <laughs> it's right. either important or it's not. Yeah, no, I agree. That's a good point you make right there. I totally agree with that. I know we have about five minutes plus or minus. I have to say it's been an honor to interview you tonight. It really has been. And uh, I know I'll have you back over on my other show, Hyperspace. But I want to ask you a little bit about the Iron Mountain. You know, there's a lot of people that talk about Iron Mountain. And and uh, were, did you actually go into the underground facility? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah I know uh, you probably can't mention or can you talk about it all or no? You know, because of the way they fired me and all, I can talk about anything I want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious as far as, you know, there's a lot of hoopla about what it's like. Um, yeah, I obviously know alien bodies, but give us yeah, a, an idea it, what, what it's it, like. Uh, it is um, it is a, a very unique place. Um, it, it's out in the middle of nowhere. And I'll share this with you. The The day that I went um, for my new investigator training, that training was held in that facility. And so I spent three weeks underground. And uh, when I arrived at the hotel that I was going to be staying in, in Butler, Pennsylvania, uh, there was actually uh, directions left for me there on how to get to Iron Mountain. And it was, uh, you know, you were out in the middle of nowhere and, uh and all of a sudden, you're going to see a parking lot park in the parking lot, and uh, a bus comes through like every 15 minutes and picks you up and actually drives underground. And when you get off the bus, you're underground. And uh, it's uh, it, it's it's very it, the the front of it actually looks uh, almost like a you're entering a prison. I mean, there's mm-hmm. there's prison you know type gates and guys with machine guns and uh, you got to walk through metal detectors if you're walking in. And uh, once you get under there, there's a, a system of roads uh, underground. Um, it's 240 feet underground. Um, wow. And uh, they have their own ventilation system and air induction system. And um, so there's road systems, there's a sidewalk system, uh, there's uh, ATMs under there. I mean, there's it's like a city underground. Mm-hmm. And, uh, wow. You 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 know you're if you're driving through there you're uh, you're driving down a road that um, you know abo- uh, four or five feet above your car is solid rock and on both sides of the little road is solid rock it's a tunnel through the rock and uh, that's the reason that they have it there and uh, it's uh, it, it's you know very temperate because it's underground and it's uh, it's easy for them to of course to control access. Wow, there that's used to be pictures of it that people could see. Um, and I think they're still there. Um, the federal government allowed, uh, NPR, the, the public radio, mm-hmm. uh, to come in and, you know, if you work there, you couldn't take pictures, but they let NPR take some pictures and used to, if you Googled, uh, NPR and then Iron Mountain, uh, you could, you know, pull up and actually see some pictures of it. It, it was, I, I did a briefing down there one day and it was, it was um, pretty neat. Uh, you know, we were at a, a conference table, and uh, you know, uh, three walls of the room were sheetrock, and then the fourth wall was uh, rock. <laughs> wow, it's like a nice bat cave. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, you know, I'd like to think there's good things in life, but thank you so much, Blake. We're out of time here. I just uh, appreciate everything you do, and thank you for for exposing this information to the masses. Yes, thank you. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in tonight, and stay tuned for Shine Side Out with David, Andre, and Becky coming up next to sell you on tonight from Denver, like they always do with their awesome show. And until next time, everybody, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you again, Blake. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Night, everybody.
Los Lazos. Take a look around, kid. What do you see? Homes being foreclosed. People working two, three jobs just to put food on the table and still drowning in debt. Don't get me wrong. This country is founded on great ideals and principles. They've all been ruined by the banks. Open your eyes to the banks that are robbing you. You know who my favorite president was? Who? Thomas Jefferson. Because he saw all of this coming and tried to stop it. He fought the banks. JFK too, and they killed him for it. The banking institution is more dangerous than an army, he said. He also said that every generation needs a revolution, Jimmy. The American dream is just that. Just a dream. War is a continuation of politics. Only by other means. Politics is a continuation of economics by other means. This is our bank. This is our war. And this is our plan of attack. Banks have become an essential threat to our democracy. So consider this justice. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station on the internet. Please help support this station so this battle can continue forward. Revolution Radio! This is the people's war. It is our war. We are the fighters. Fight it then. Fight it with all that is in us. And may God defend the right. Warning, warning. We gotta stop us! They're gonna kill us all! See how the trouble you've started? Be they a government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, or human beings. When the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part, you can't even passively take part, and you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop, and you've got to win the day to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Revolution Radio of freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station throwing ourselves upon the gears of the machine.